Thanks for joining another MOIP episode. Today I have a special guest, Jonathan Levine. He is the Chief Strategy Officer of Chain Analysis. And uh, we'll be talking about uh, the crypto industry, about how he got into the space and uh, all the noise these guys are doing. Is that a, with regulators, is that a good thing for crypto or not a good thing for crypto? So Jonathan, thanks for joining and uh, welcome to the MOIP show. Thanks so much. Great to be here. So uh, there's a lot of things I wanted to cover, but uh, uh, I definitely, you know, Celsius was one of the companies that kind of filed the Reg D and the FinCEN filing right from the beginning, right? So we kind of basically said there is no way this thing is happening without us uh, being fully compliant and without the industry as a whole kind of uh, finding the right regulatory regime to operate under. And I think you guys, I think, uh, kind of believe in the same um, same path, right? Am I right or, or did I get it wrong? No, so I, think, I think you're right. And the reason I guess you're right is that, you know, when it comes to uh, any sort of financial transactions, anything that involves consumers, there needs to be some level of control around you know what what can protect them what what do we do to ensure that there's like a fair and open marketplace for people and you know the other thing about this is that the way that the financial regulations are really written is they are principal regulations they're agnostic to technology just because you transfer you know some money to someone else over over an internet protocol doesn't mean that it's any different to transferring it by another mechanism. And so you know, all of the anti-money laundering uh, statutes you know, still apply. All of the you know, securities laws still apply. And, and really, the tests about you know, how the regulation is applied is just about you know, how do those principles translate over into a new technology. And so it's definitely still in the jurisdiction of uh, the regulators. And then in specific instances, there's facts and circumstances that, that you need to assess. But really, you know, the way to understand financial regulation is that it's a principle that we think is important. And then it just gets applied um, with the facts and circumstances um, in a new technology. Sure. And, and uh, we obviously use you guys. Uh, great service. Uh, definitely helps us with kind of try to keep uh, some of the bad apples from uh, being thrown into the basket. Right. So uh, do you see when you when you look at the activity, the nefarious activity worldwide, do you see um, uh, more activity or more concentration in the crypto space? Or do you feel that we are just like uh, any other vertical credit cards or banks or, or financial institutions? Yeah, I mean, the way that I think about this is that, again, I look at, I look at cryptocurrency as a technology. Yeah, ultimately, I think that everyone around the world is going to be touched by the technology in some form. And so it doesn't matter whether it's um, today, it's you know, Bitcoin or cash or anything else. You know, everything gets used by criminals and um, there's no there's no real difference and what you need is a strategy about how you continue to protect the vulnerable in society you continue to have you know uh, an, a fair marketplace for investors and that is going to be a challenge because it's something that you know it's a technology that is really going to touch sort of basically everyone in the world. And that includes all the criminals as well. So um, I think about it as, you know, yes, there's been points in Bitcoin's history where there have been sort of large hacks, large scams, large um, uh, darknet markets and stuff like that, like Silk Road. But, but really those are, you know, part and parcel of a technology that's being broadly adopted by, you know, millions of people around the world. and you know, that was always going to happen. Um, the really interesting thing is also that you know, there have been more cases being prosecuted using this type of information um, than, you know, a lot of other places because, you know, law enforcement is 
you know getting up to speed and is able to get after some of those some of those bad apples that have been thrown in with the bunch right yeah so so do you feel that having these utilities uh, uh, kind of makes regulators more calm and more uh, accommodating or do you feel that we're still uh, ways away from globally you know regulators looking at this uh, vertical and say okay I can manage it just the way I'm managing banks or some other institutions. Yeah, I, I think we've seen like a lot of progress actually in the last, I would say, 18 months, um, where you know there really has been a shift in the acceptance of regulators that this is here to stay, um, and they need to actually, you know, adapt their regulations, build special capacity, really understand this space. So. Yeah, I think that we've definitely seen a um, an increase in their ability to accept it, firstly, and then really un start to do the work in seeing how their laws apply to it. Um, we've seen some some global cohesion of regulation in terms of, you know, especially on the AML side of things, on the anti money laundering side, uh, you have the FATF, which is the Financial Action Task Force, which is sort of the very much international body that helps coordinate this type of regulation come out with you know very specific recommendations for the sector. Um, so I think that you see that that is something that um, is becoming something that is truly global that, that these regulators are embracing. I think the thing that, and, and people have been paying some attention to that. I think the other thing that maybe people have been paying less attention to is on the tax front. Um, and you can see that you know, tax regulators around the world have actually started to pay closer attention to it, um, understand it more. Um, and that for me is also a very big sign of acceptance that this is you know, a legitimate way to earn money and accumulate capital and needs to be taxed accordingly. Um, you know, businesses like yourselves you know, start to allow people to earn money earn an income in crypto and actually you know, that needs to be taxed and people need to you know hopefully that that results in you know greater economic activity so that's where i think that if you look at it like that's a really positive sign that you know regulators are here to to declare a, a you know a framework for overseeing crypto yeah i think there's still plenty in the crypto community that feel that uh Crypto is special and it does not need to be uh, taxed or, you know, they want to hide their spoils and, and things like that. And, and obviously when you do that, um, you know, you cause regulators and the taxmen to dig even, even harder, right? Because they know that there's just too many people not paying their fair share. The, I wanted to touch about, uh, we've seen in the news, uh, recently several announcements about large banks uh, kind of being uh, caught with, uh, you know, either uh, uh, not reporting or not reporting enough on, on some nefarious activities and, and uh, uh, you know, like basically the amounts of money that they were talking about, like I think Deutsche Bank was like $1.3 trillion. But if you ask the average person on the street, they would tell you that crypto has all the criminals and all the bad stuff is done through uh, cryptocurrencies. So if you had to put these things in perspective, like where, uh, how much actual, uh, uh, you know, illegal activity do you see? Because you guys watch that every day uh, in, in percentage terms, right? I mean, when you look at the overall volume or the market cap versus like the financial system as a whole and specifically like banks with international commerce and things like that. Yeah, you're talking about the same ballpark because the same, like, it kind of goes back to my earlier point is, you know, you're talking about technology where you've got like the adoption by you know, the whole of society and the whole of society also contains all the criminal activity as well. So it's all in the same ballpark. You know, banks are being used um, to launder you know, proceeds of crime. Cryptocurrencies are also being used it's roughly in the same ballpark. It's in the you know, single digit percentages. Um, you know, last year we saw um, you know, two and a half percent um, because of plus token, which was an investment scam uh, that we tied in 
in Bitcoin, for example, this year is looking a little bit lower than that. Um, you know, currently going into the into the last quarter of the year. Um, yeah, we do track it very closely, but I I think that in, in the end, like the, the percentages are going to be very similar between sort of right. the the money laundered in the traditional financial sector and and, uh, and in crypto. Right, and then and I've seen these reports about uh, North Korea and a few other uh, countries that are basically looked at this as almost like a, a revenue stream. Right, they have like people dedicating to try to uh, grab coins from people who are either. Uh, not protecting their assets well or exchanges that basically left a few doors open. When, when you look at um, nation states who are basically have programs effectively targeting the crypto community, I mean, do you see that as, a, you know, something special or there or there are there similar examples of that uh, in the financial system as a whole? No, again, it's, it's, it's very similar. So you know, the, the nation states, like, uh, like North Korea, you know, depending depending on the action, they can be financially motivated, but they can also be um, they can also be uh, just disruption. Like it could be just you know general chaos that they want to create havoc for for some other reason. And so, you know, definitely, we see you know dedicated action on cryptocurrencies. We see you know, theft from exchanges, as you say. Um, but we see this in other forms of crime as well. You know, organized crime groups that are connected to nation state actors, the drug trade, um, human trafficking, um, sex trafficking, like all this stuff is you know, linked. There's very close links between some of the organized crime groups and some of these um, nation state actors. Um, so I don't, I don't, again, I don't, I don't see it as different. I see it as you know, it's something that needs to be addressed and something that, you know, you know, governments like the United States, you know, definitely are caring more about it. Um, if you saw sort of DOJ came out with their enforcement framework last last week or the week before, um, you know, that that's really a, a step in the direction of you know, acknowledging these threats, but but meeting it with a proportional level of um, of interest and uh, and uh, making sure that they can get on top of it. Yeah, it's it's definitely, I mean, I think the community in general has basically uh, done a great job blacklisting certain addresses, enabling the functionality to, for example, freeze uh, USDC or USDT, not allow it to kind of be monetized even if it got stolen. So have we done enough or you think uh, we're just at the beginning of kind of like finding the tools to even after something like this happens, an event happens, to be able to uh, freeze or capture or, uh, or you know apprehend the, the either the assets or the people. Yeah, you know, I think the we're moving we're moving this along, right? Um, you know, I would say that you know every time something like that happens. You know, I even sit with my team and talk about you know how much more we could be doing. Could we get it faster? Could we could we alert so like is there a more programmatic way to share information between different jurisdictions about this? Is there a way for us to you know connect some of our exchanges directly with our law enforcement partners um, on you know issues of you know, time sensitive nature, like we're constantly thinking about getting better at, at this. So I think that, um, you know, are we doing enough? Um, you know, I never think that we're doing enough as a business. So I, I think about like the opportunities and ways for, for us to get after financial crime in a more meaningful way. I, I, I always think about that. Um, but are we, you know, are we addressing it? Um, you know, I'm definitely seeing our regulated exchanges um, take this very seriously and build build good programs and and start to deal with it. So, yeah, I think that that's good. Um, I think the frontier for me at the moment is on the information sharing and uh, being able to move investigations really at the pace of where the technology is at. And and for me, that's like the big the big opportunity for us as chain analysis is to play play a big role in that.
Right, and I think we, we're, as an industry, I think we're adapting or moving faster than traditional fintech, right? Like if I, when I look at how slowly uh, traditional banks or other financial institutions implement new programs, like sometimes it takes them 10 years to actually get these things implemented. We, we will look like lightning speed to regulators, right? Because they ask us to do stuff and a year later, all, all the major participants are already up and running with those programs, right? I mean, you agree with that? No, I, I mean, you know, I've got to be careful because we have FinTech customers of ours. Right. So, um, <laughs> uh, right. I don't really, I, and I think also the line is, is, is blurring a little bit. So I think that the, the difference between the FinTech uh, companies and crypto companies is also collapsing a little bit. So, you know, plenty of our FinTech customers are custodying crypto today. Yeah bring that directly to their customers. Um, so I've got to be a little bit careful. Um, and it also, I would say some of the banks are, are, are trying to do the same. So, um, you know, I think in the end, um, the industry has moved quite quickly. I think um, one thing just for you know people who are listening in the industry, uh, the ability to collaborate on, with law enforcement on these cases and to respond quickly and to be helpful in explaining stuff to law enforcement has gone a long way in bolstering the reputation of the industry. And so um, I think that, yeah, as much as people can continue to do that, uh, that's that's really effective. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I remember the days where when you got a call from the Secret Service or whatever, you ran away. Now they call you because they're looking for advice and they hope ho ho they hope you can co help them cooperate and catch some of the bad guys. So yeah. we definitely, uh, uh, at least the good actors are all on the same side of the table. And uh, uh, it's definitely have been a, a lot of success story. You, you guys, your name was mentioned in many uh, apprehensions where, uh, you know, really famous cases. I don't know if you can talk about any of them, but where basically people use your tools, the, the both the uh, nation states as well as some of the kind of more... Uh, Local regulators call uh, use the tools to uh, find and apprehend uh, uh, bad actors, right? So I don't know if you want to share with us any kind of uh, yeah. exciting story. Yeah, I mean, so you know, the nice thing about doing the work we do, and you know, a lot of it is not a lot of it is we we provide technology. We don't provide. Um, we're not really involved day to day. You know necessarily in, in, in a lot of the cases that get published. Um, but, you know, the technology that we provide gets leveraged by these regulators, by these um, law enforcement agencies to do these cases. You know, the stuff that goes public um, can be, you know, fairly high profile. The you know, child abuse material site that was taken down with Welcome to Video, uh, with IRSCI, with Homeland Security, with DOJ, with the National Crime Agency in the UK, with you know, South Korean law enforcement. You know, it's a really good example in where cryptocurrency was you know, used by the administrator of the site. Um, you had people around the world who were paying for content. Um, and that was really the, the downfall of the site. Um, you know, we could map out all the transactions, see where the administrator was, was cashing out in South Korea. Um, we could find then you know, a lot of the people who were either earning money from the site or paying into the site for content and go around the world and, you know, rescue, you know, 20 children from uh, harm and, you know, arrest 330 people who were, you know, despicable people who were buying this, this, this disgusting, disgusting content. And, you know, that was really through the work of being able to just follow the money on the blockchain. And, um, so we have been involved in, in those types of cases. I would say that most of the cases that we're involved in, um, we actually have no knowledge about them, right? So we're a, we're a technology and um, our law enforcement partners use it for that. Um, you know, it's very nice when they come out publicly and thank us that they, they can't always do that. Um, so, you know, in the cases, uh, but, but we've seen, you know, amazing success and we've trained, you know, thousands of people now to be able to do this work, um, and so you know, I think that uh, when I look when I look forward, I see you know, there's still like a very good age of like collaborating with the industry um, on these types of cases and, and bringing more of them more of them forward. Um, 
Yeah, we were also named in the Twitter hack earlier this year. Um, you know, helping helping find the the perpetrators of that, um, and then also um, with the uh, terrorist financing case, the biggest um, terrorist financing case involving crypto with um, you know ISIS and uh, Al Qaeda in, in the Middle East. Yeah, you know, fairly small amounts of money in that case, but you know there was a long time in crypto when that type of case was everyone's greatest fear. The greatest fear was be that crypto is now tied to some form of terrorist financing. And if you look at it, like, actually that didn't that didn't move the price. It didn't change the industry. The reason is because there's now a robust program or an increasingly robust program with the government um, to mitigate those types of threats and to actually enable you know good businesses to to continue to operate. Yeah, no, these are all good points and, and good examples. Uh, I think a, a lot of people, um, um, again, just because of the 11-year history of Bitcoin, think that uh, uh, Bitcoin is like this, again, secretive way of transferring stuff. I Meanwhile, you know, it's exactly the opposite. It's a permanent record that is available to everyone at all times. So uh, maybe, again, let's go back a little bit and just describe what the company does uh, what what areas of business do you guys cover? Because I think for for the not so techy guys uh, who watch this, um, uh, I think it would be helpful for them to understand, uh, you know, what what you help achieve and uh, why it is so easy to basically identify end to end almost any uh, uh, transaction on a public blockchain. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, chain analysis started. 2014, we we essentially came up with yeah, a very simple question, which is, yeah, tell me how and why people use cryptocurrency. And the answer to that question becomes really important for yeah, risk and compliance, becomes really important for um, being able to do these types of investigations. And, and ultimately, it becomes very important for making investment cases and being able to understand what is going on in this new economy. So what I think is um, what is important is um, we take you know, every, every Bitcoin transaction, every cryptocurrency transaction is public. Um, we take that information and we create a map between those transactions and the real world. So typically, Cryptocurrency transactions are brokered by some sort of intermediary. Yeah, either it's Celsius, Coinbase, Kraken, Bitstamp, um, some sort of company. And what we're able to do, um, either through um, our own collection methods or, or through partnership, is be able to know which transactions are done by which entities. And then we provide that back to everyone to help them run their business. So you know, for the exchanges, um, they need to use us for transaction monitoring. They need to know, you know are the transactions that are coming in and out of their, of their venue, is it, is it risky or not? So they rely on us to do transaction monitoring. Um, if you're a law enforcement agency or you're a regulator, you're looking at, you know, can I identify some suspicious activity? Can I can I follow the money in these types of investigations? Um, and then we're increasingly seeing sort of you know, other other use cases that go beyond that. Um, we've seen a lot of cybersecurity firms use us to look at um, you know, threat actors that are targeting Fortune 500 companies. Um, we're seeing banks use us. Uh, to look at onboarding cryptocurrency businesses and providing services to the industry. Um, and, you know, what we've really started to open up and say, you know, there are many people in the world who need to understand how and why people are using cryptocurrency. And we're going to increasingly make our data and insights available to all of those people. Right. So it's, a, it's becoming more and more of a big data play versus just uh, uh, kind of like uh, looking for the bad guys, right? And yeah, and, and this was the thing from the beginning is that I said, you know, my, my background's in economics. And 
the reason why I really got into crypto was because I said that you know, cryptocurrency, this was in 2012. I said, you know, cryptocurrency is this you know, transformational technology. The, the business that knows the most about how and why people use the technology is going to be a really important business in connecting all the organizations that are part of that economy and connecting it to investors who need to understand, you know, the capital movements and to understand the opportunity. And can I build, you know, this, um, this business that really understands the most about it. Um, and so, you know, I started that journey in 2012 and we, we've been amassing this, this, um, understanding knowledge, human capital, um, for the whole time. And now we're looking at, you know, that big data play, you know, where else can we go with that? Yeah, so you touched a little bit about your background. Uh, if you don't mind, tell us a little bit about your journey falling into the rabbit hole. How did you came across crypto and wh what did you think about the first time you saw it? Because when I when I saw it the first time, I was like, come on, guys. I mean, this is crazy. Mining, like what? This is the biggest waste of energy and computing power that I've ever seen and communication that I've ever seen in my life. You know, I, it was it was hard for me to basically conceive of the efficiency of the public blockchain with the inefficiency of how we arrived to it. So what was your, when you looked at it, what, what was your experience? Yeah, I, I would say like very similar. Um, yeah, I was sitting in a pub in Oxford in the UK um, and it was only after like the third pint that I like even <laughs> like really entertained that this right. would be something. Um, and so I was sitting there with my friend Tom and he was saying that we should start arbitrage trading between uh, Bitstamp and Mt. Gox. And I just didn't understand like why the price should be different or like why this was even an opportunity. Um, and so really, but when I, when I, when I got home, I started to think that, you know, I had a very classical economics education, um, you know, Bitcoin really doesn't fit very well into that. Um, but I started to think about it more in terms of, um, you know, how technology evolves um, and how it gets adopted. And the interesting thing about Bitcoin is that it just continues to ask some of the best questions about, you know, how money works, um, who controls the internet, how you know people around the world can transfer value what types of you know future business models might be possible if we rebuild the financial system um what does it mean for what like why are there barriers to financial inclusion you know all these types of questions started to be asked by bitcoin and, and bitcoin in 2012 wasn't presenting all the answers it was actually a corner case. Yeah, it was a corner yeah. case of computer. It was, yeah, it was just a. It was an elegant, you know, computer science um, solution to a problem to to a many theoretical problem, right? Um, but but the interesting thing was, and you know, by 2012, it was already starting with this. Is that it creates a movement and it creates a an adoption of technology that then gets, you know innovated upon and, and adjusted and, and people come up with new business models and you've just seen like a rapid experimentation and, and innovation in you know, how people build these systems. And when you look at what's happened in the last 10 years of going from, you know, an elegant theoretical solution to a computer science problem to, you know, us sitting on this podcast and, you know, hundreds of millions of people around the world being exposed to it you get to understand the inevitability of the adoption of the technology and the innovation that can come on top of it. And so, you know, I started to, I started to think about, well, if it's asking all of those best, like fundamental questions that I think are going to be the most important things for our generation, you know, really, you know, getting a good understanding of like how it's being used and who's using it and, collecting that data and understanding that data and being able to you know, explain to people who weren't collecting it what it meant. And that's really what drove us as chain analysis is to, to give the people who most need that insight and knowledge 
in the most easy way possible through the products. And and the way that we we figured that out, and you know, I have no I had no background in the government, um, had no background um, understanding what the needs of re regulators were. Um, but what we figured was that, that those were the people that needed to understand this the most. And if we were able to build, you know, products that the government would be able to understand what um, the sector was doing and what this meant, that that would pave the way for private sector adoption. And so you know, the early couple of years of Chainalysis was very focused on the government, making sure that regulators weren't going to ban Bitcoin, right? Like that was still a challenge at that point. Um, but then, you know, really think about um, then how we translate this into the private sector and how we can get there to be more growth um, actually in the industry more generally. Um, so, you know, I think my, my journey came from, you know, deep skepticism of, of Bitcoin as a solution um, to really understanding it as a, as a technology movement uh, rather than, you know, a point solution to a particular problem. Yeah, I think uh, three points can solve any problem. You know, it's like uh, <laughs> so. The uh, so here we are building a new system, right? We're trying to basically create a new infrastructure, new rails that uh, have the opportunity to uh, make a more just and more open system for seven and a half billion people on this planet. And and what I'm struggling with is seeing. Uh, a lot of people who come from like the old world of finance who bring all the bad practices into this new environment. Oh, let's charge everybody fees. Let's have centralized exchanges. Let's so this while decentralization is this beautiful, pure uh, model, it, it looks like after whatever, 11, or almost 12 years that we're ending more and more with uh, baggage from the old uh, system. Right. So how do we how do we kind of, um, uh, and on the, on the other side of it, you have, you know, DEXs and AMMs and things like that that are really, I think, providing an opportunity. So how, how do we create more of the new and less of the old? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I mean, you know, I'll sit here and you know, I think that for me, this is about the economic forces at play which provide the best ultimate consumer benefit so it, for me like whether there are centralized exchanges or decentralized exchanges or some sort of hybrid in between like the important thing is that you know there's competition and innovation that's driving this whole movement forward so you know I think that if the you know the technology itself opens up this amazingly you know competitive landscape right where um, you know innovation can happen at sort of the pace of DeFi in one section and it can happen there for like two years and no one can pay any attention to it and then suddenly like something clicks and there's product market fit and there's loads of liquidity goes into it and so you can you can think that people are tinkering on the side of this movement and you could dismiss it immediately as like ICOs are a waste of time, like capital formation is solved or like you need some sort of centralized repository for this and that. And actually what it means is that like you have the economic conditions for, you know, great competitive, like great competition, and people driving like the best user and customer experience. And so I, I actually don't mind if there are some degree of decentralization, some degree of centralization, but to your point, like anyone who's gonna really import the old model is gonna get disrupted. The, like my belief is that the technology that allows anyone in the world to move their money from one place to the other and take real control of it is, is going to prompt a movement away from services that gouge consumers and that we will have a better outcome as a result of it. Now, the, those centralized businesses may still exist, um, but that's not a failure of Bitcoin necessarily. Like, I think that um, it's easy to look at it and not necessarily see that, you know, 
uh, some of those businesses will like will face disruption or you know have the threat of disruption and so will become better at, at serving the consumers. Yeah, I know. I totally agree with you. I think uh, there's still places in the world that use fax machines, but that doesn't mean they can use VoIP for free. But <laughs> they still de they still depend on fax machine. Even in the United States, some legal documents you can only submit through a fax machine. Believe it or not, to this date, we so have a we have a fax machine in one of our offices. So I totally <laughs> I totally understand you. Do try to do chain analysis on that one. So. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, but di digging in on AMMs and DEXs just a little bit more. So, so again, you know, Celsius uh, effectively created the first uh, kind of like the first function where you could be paid in a token on earning yield in on Ethereum or Bitcoin or anything else. The sell token was the first one. And uh, we do full KYC ML for everybody who participates. We issue them a 1099. So we fully complied. When you look at uh, like what's what's happening today, where most of the DeFi guys effectively say there's no need for KYC, there's no need for AML. Uh, what do you think? What's your view on how regulators are going to view this, and and where is that a good thing for the for the innovation for the development, or is that something that's going to threaten uh, the, all of this innovation going forward? Look, I think that. Um yeah, it's a, it's a it's a very interesting question. I yeah now like fortunately I, I I've given sort of my operational side of our business to people who can run this much more effectively than I can, um, who do the operational side of our day to day, and I get to think about questions like this, which are like yeah forward looking, like what it, what is this going to mean for for chain analysis? What does this mean for the industry? So um, yeah, I think about. Um, I think about this a fair bit. From an enforcement point of view, it becomes more challenging, right? Um, you've got more diffuse responsibility across, you know, all the different, you know, operators. You've got sort of the people who write the contract, the people who deploy the contract, the people who um, earn money from the contract. Um, there's lots of, you know, sort of different levels of responsibility there, and um, what I think about is, you know, to some extent, that's an amazing innovation. The, it's, not, it's not necessarily like a bad thing uh, from a sort of business model standpoint. It definitely presents some challenges to law enforcement. Um, the, the, you know, whether there'll be you know, widespread enforcement on DeFi stuff, you know, I, think it, I think it sort of remains to be seen in the, the types of each implementation is so different. You know, uh, a lot of these businesses have different degrees of centralization, different degrees of you know, who's the liquidity providers, where are they located, how, how dominant are you know, certain members, and you know, how much money is being earned by the operator. So it's just, you know, there's many, many different facts and circumstances, and so very hard to predict, like, wide, to cast a wide net on, like, what is going to happen with DeFi. Um, I'll just come back to like my original point, which is it's principle-led regulation. So, you know, to the extent that you interpret the principles and you are you know, responsible for value transfer or earning money out of it, then then it's something that um, something that should be considered. Um, so, I don't think that um, I don't think it's necessarily bad for the industry. I think it's good for the industry that people are experimenting and, and thinking about these. Um, yeah, I think when when it comes to you know your business and where I see this sort of playing out is you know, there will be a regulated venue and structure that attracts you know most of the institutional capital, and if you look at like more traditional markets, you know the retail share. You know, even in the current stock market environment with Robinhood and et cetera, like the retail share of the market is just tiny compared to the institutional um, capital that, that is being deployed. And so, you know, I think that there is definitely going to be sort of a much more, yeah, 
a concentration of this activity that is going to be regulated because the entities that put stuff into those protocols are regulated and that there is necessarily sort of a business there. Um, yeah, but, but I think that, you know, the whole point and the beauty of this decentralization is that you have people playing with new business models on the side. And I don't believe that those are attracting institutional capital today. And I think that they do need to get adapted in some way in order to be more in line with sort of your approach um, in order for, for more institutional players to, to come into it. Um, and, and that's the place that I'm, you know, I spend space, I spend time thinking about all these different scenarios and, and what chain analysis might be able to do uh, in the future there. Yeah, we'll see how it develops. I mean, obviously, no one has all the answers. It's still, it's moving so fast that anyone who says this is how it is, maybe it's been like this yesterday, but today it's already different. So, so there's no, you know. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, I think one thing that I've learned in crypto, you know, I I now have you know, almost almost ten years of pattern recognition. So you get to like understand what 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 goes on. Um, but it, but it doesn't it doesn't necessarily make me like you know perfect at prediction. So like I I I wasn't sitting here you know a year and a half ago saying you know Uniswap is going to be the deepest book of liquidity on a whole range of tokens in the world. Like that wasn't that wasn't what I was thinking. Um, and so I think that the um, you know one of the things that uh, I think about here is exactly as you say, this, this thing is moving so quickly. The, the really nice thing about DeFi is that there is so much experimentation that um, you know, keeping up to date with that is, is uh, and not making too many predictions on podcasts is kind of the most important thing. <laughs> That's the safest route. So no, but like t talking about Uniswap as an example, uh, you know, cell token is, is listed on Uniswap and uh, we have more liquidity there than in, on any other exchange. And, a lot of it has to do, to your point, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that a lot of large exchanges wanted to charge us crazy money, you know, like millions of dollars to list with them. And we waited, we waited, we waited. So when Uniswap showed up, uh, it's all that demand found its way to Uniswap. It's not, so it's not that Uniswap is so great. It's that, the, again, that the, some of these exchanges are so bad that when you when you offer something uh, that is just market driven, like you said before, I'm just tying all your points together. Uh, 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 when you offer something better, there's no going back to the old model. You cannot go back to that centralized thing. And and money always finds the most efficient way uh, to be deployed. And and it's just beautiful to see uh, that growth and adoption and and and. Uh, and so definitely something where uh, the community wins again and again, uh, acting its own best interest uh, versus some of these uh, centralized solutions. And I think some of this innovation, we don't see a lot of that innovation in fintech because the rules and the rails are so rigid, right? And here, uh, basically a, a, a one person, any, a programmer by himself can deploy a whole new uh, protocol. And uh, basically if they, solved some of these problems either on the um for example on the liquidity side or on the um uh, how different parties get compensated uh, uh you can basically create a new business model overnight and have billions of dollars uh basically use that where it's almost impossible to do that in traditional markets yeah no i i, I mean that's a that's a really nice summary and again it's it's kind of that's the reason to pay close attention to this space is, you know, you know for the use case that you, for the Celsius token, you know, that's one type of use case that Uniswap steps into, but there's going to be opportunities where DeFi will step into you know, more traditional financial applications where, you know, there will be pent up demand that will then, you know, flood into the space. And to your point, like, it's a one-way street. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it, it will find the path of least resistance. And um, yeah, I think that's super exciting. Yeah, and today I think we have some limitations on the speed of the blockchain or the security or, or uh, again, the rails uh, to get in and out of different asset classes. I think still a lot of limitation in those areas. But as those things get solved, again, 
I lived there in the beginning of the internet and I remember how everybody told me it takes a whole PC to do one voice of IP session because that's we could barely do one session on a 386, right? I mean, it, it took all the processing power to do it in memory and everything else to basically encode it on the TCP IP network and ship it on the other side. And and I kept explaining to people, no, you don't understand. We're gonna have multi cores. We're gonna do everything in memory. And 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 people look at me like uh, like I, I was I was living on on some other planet, you know. And and today, you know, any of these devices does a uh, thousand concurrent sessions just on a single processor, right? So, so people definitely underestimate, uh, it, this technology is so inefficient in one way, right? That people look at it and say, look how much you have to spend the electricity of Switzerland just to maintain the network, right? Just to maintain the blockchain. And, and, and they get stuck on those things instead of looking at the uh, massive advantages of decentralization, of inclusion, of of giving people access that they will never have otherwise, uh, which really opens so many opportunities that, that uh, you know, I, 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 I get so excited about this stuff and you know, I wake up every day and I'm just trying to solve the next problem and the next problem and so on. So I'm sure I'm sure you're the same way, but. Uh, yeah, no, and, and I've been super, you know, I think that the, the interesting thing about chain analysis has been, you know, we built a business that's, you know, been been here for six years. You know, we really you know, grew the companies sort of responsibly and like understanding sort of oh, we're in this for the long run. You know, I'm in, I'm not in a rush. Um, you know, who are all the types of customers that we need to be able to serve in order for the industry to really progress? And um, you know, what's exciting is that you know, we seem to be at like an inflection point here in 2020. Um, yeah, the macro, the macroeconomic environment, you know, the technology itself, the type of innovation that's going on. It's, it's a moment where, you know, there is plenty of these things to solve. And, you know, I'm very much, you know, paying attention to, you know, where, where we are taking the business, you know, forward and, and where we, we, we need to be in the next year too, because it, it might be you know, substantially different to where, to where we are today. Yeah. And I wanted to touch on that because you actually have your your fingers on the thermometer here uh, because you your signups are kind of like almost like leading indicators to who's joining uh, the crypto community, right? Because so tell us a little bit. Do you see an increase from institutions? Do you see an increase from corporate users? We're seeing all these like guys who are who are thinking of basically using their um, uh, treasury, right, to putting all that in Bitcoin. Do you see any corporate usage? Like, where where is the demand uh, for your product coming from uh, these days? Yeah, so it, it's really interesting. Like, our private sector business is is booming for sure. Um, you know, we're seeing um, a lot of different use cases emerge. You know, as I said, we get Fortune 500 companies who are coming to us. Um, on the cyber security side of this, um, maybe they're also using it for their internal treasury decisions that they're thinking about. You know, we don't get to see that, but the the you know we're seeing you know this year I've seen global banks start to enter the custody space um, in a more meaningful way, um, where they're looking to use us on their own custody product. Uh, I've seen a lot of payment service providers step into this space to think about you know how they can onboard you know cryptocurrency businesses and offer you know new payment products in you know crypto um i've also seen again like a lot of fintechs um just see this as almost table stakes um you know in the competitive landscape of like asset management um you know the crypto seen as table stakes um you know i want to be able to trade stocks shares options but also, um, I want to be able to trade my crypto in the same venue. So, um, you know, definitely seeing all of that. And then um, I think that, um, yeah, you're seeing like Square, MicroStrategy, you'll start to see more of that happen on the asset class. But then on the, on the other side, I think that, um, you know, we're seeing um, some smaller some smaller companies approach us with new business models and us try and figure out whether we can help support them. You know, a DEX that has, you know, one, um, you know, wants to be able to KYC their users or something like that. And that's where 
um, you know, I think we, we're seeing some innovation at the fringe as well, which is going to be more exciting over the next year. So definitely an increase from an institutional standpoint. Um, yeah, I would say that we're now a global business as well. Um, you know, our global business has been growing at, at the same time um, in APAC, in EMEA, um, as more countries implement regulation as well. Yeah, definitely. Any like new features and new capabilities you can share with us on the upcoming releases or things that you think will help with the industry adoption? Yeah, I mean, people should go like a few things. One is, you know, as I said, we've started to really talk about broadening access to our data. Um, you can go to markets.chainalysis.com. We've got some really interesting data about what's going on in Bitcoin, um, you know, f flows between exchanges. Um, things like you know, how much risky activity is going on. Um, we're, we're definitely putting out a lot of reports on sort of the geographic adoption of crypto. So, you know, we're really very close to a lot of that data and making it more available so that people, you know, to your point, people need to be able to understand that this is transparent and understand what's going on. So um, there's there's a lot of push at Chain Analysis to do that. Um, We've got some some newer stuff happening with our our onboarding product with with Cryptos, which allows you know banks and payment processors to be able to you know assess the risk of their counterparties in the crypto space. Um, so pretty happy about how that's progressing, um, and always always improving our our transaction monitoring and our investigation product. But nothing nothing to be shared um, of, of significance. So you just need to change your name to Bloomberg and and provide all the data and you'll be done, right? That's the yeah, yeah, yeah. We could uh, and then maybe build some hardware. <laughs> exactly. Come up with a beautiful new terminal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that would be it. That, no, yeah. th this this has been great. Uh, happy to answer. Do you have any questions for me or any anything you want me to uh, to touch I, on? Or? I would I would love to understand. Sort of, I want to turn the Dex question. You know, back around and and some of the lending protocols. You know, for me, you know, I think about lending as sort of very core to financial infrastructure, and you know, super exciting when people are building that on top of crypto. Um, just very curious about like your thoughts about how a, a more decentralized model might might play out in the lending market. Yeah. So so first, I mean, the centralized world had. Uh, many attempts at peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer. I mean, uh, and and many of them did not work because of the credit issues, right? So the credit standard just kept deteriorating and and these matching engines just had more and more losses until uh, no lenders were willing to lend any money. So, so overall, I think over time, um, and that's why Celsius uh, chose to only do uh, uh, basically secure uh, lending. So we only lend against digital assets. Um, and I st I'm starting to see, again, uh, kind of like uh, uh, slowly, but definitely starting to see uh, some of these standards being relaxed by different lenders in, in the crypto world. Uh, but decentra the decentralized version of it today is really chasing the reward. So like if you're borrowing on Aave or on uh, Compound, uh, you're doing it because you're trying to get those extra tokens and extra yield. Uh, Celsius, like I think 90% of our income has to do with lending to institutions and exchanges. So even though we participate on the DeFi side, uh, you know, none of our users come to us because they're trying to kind of game the system or get this or that reward. Yes, they're getting rewards and sell token, but we actually earn the yield and we generate positive returns for the entire system. So the, the wheel kind of completes and can continue running, where traditional uh, DeFi, it's almost like a short-term experiment, 60 or 90 days, during which there is a airdrop of coins or tokens, and when that stops, the liquidity moves somewhere else. So, so I think there is still a need for the underlying uh, long-term business model, for a lot of these DeFi. So I think, we're yes, we're perfecting the the use of the token, we're perfecting the DEXs, we're perfecting the AMMs, but the economic activity in the cycle is not, uh, you're basically 
uh, the early adapters are dumping on the late adapters, right? And and when the music stops, uh, the, all the liquidity moves somewhere else. So, so I think uh, for us to scale this, right, we kind of had four waves of uh, uh, of innovation. You had the cyberpunk, you had the um, libertarians, you had the speculators, and now everybody thinks the institutions are going to come and and bail us out effectively by plowing hundreds of billions of dollars into this network. And they're not going to do that unless they see real economic activity. They're not going to play all these games that uh, some of the DeFi guys are doing. So, so I think it's, it's the industry as a whole, if we want to graduate into the hundreds of billions of dollars from where we are today, uh, we need a much more proven and long-term sustainable uh, business models, which, which again, I think all of us, including Celsius, has to prove that uh, what we're doing now with a billion six, we can do with 16 billion or 160 billion because a lot of the larger institutions just looking at this and saying, it's too small for me. I can't, I can't. your pond where you all excited and you're, you're splashing the water and you're making a big party is just way too small for me. Yeah. No, and, and that makes perfect sense. And, you know, to the extent that we, we also there like, yeah, we think of ourselves as, you know, key infrastructure provider in the space. We've got a sustainable business model, still growing quickly at 200 people. And uh, where we're at in our journey, um, we think that that's yeah, really important and seen as important by the industry of, of the credibility. Yeah, look, I, I think it's a f fundamental kind of element of this circle, right? If you cannot, uh, just like you cannot complete the circle here without lending and borrowing that is sustainable, you cannot complete it without transparency, access to information, the ability to audit things, uh, regulators being comfortable with all of that. So I think we're still building the, the rails, we're building the, the pipes to make everything work. And, and again, we're changing the wheels while the car is going at uh, whatever, 80 or 90 miles an hour, right? We're upgrading to to lightning we were trying to do all kind of other stuff and and a lot of that stuff is still experimental i mean we're uh, you know uh, ethereum 2.0 is is still an experiment right so so scaling this if we fail in scaling it doesn't matter all that, all this other stuff that we achieved right so all the pieces have to complete and then uh, uh then you're going to see that flood of uh, new assets and new users uh come on board i think this is a very critical moment. I know everybody's saying about that every year, but I think 2021 is definitely a, an ex exceptionally critical moment in time because you're kind of graduating from the experimental side to like, okay, let's scale this thing up. Yeah, I completely agree. All right, great. Look, this was great. We we spent an hour. I appreciate you joining and, and sharing your, your thoughts and, and uh, your experience and uh, love what you're doing. I mean, it's exceptionally important to the industry and we're really happy to be a customer and use it. We use it every day. So it's uh, it's definitely a service that would make it very hard for us to do what we do if we didn't have. And uh, thanks for being part of the crypto community.